Thank you, Emily. <coughs> so, um, impeachment seems to be in the news. Um, and what we wanted to do with this conversation this morning with an historian and a legal expert and an expert on uh, American public opinion is step back a little bit in the beginning and look at impeachment's legacy and see what we lessons and insights we draw from that and then return to the present moment and apply some of the insights that we've learned. So um, I want to start with you, Yoni, and, and just talk about this, this instrument that was built into the Constitution. Uh, only four presidents so far have faced a full-blown House inquiry. Uh, Andrew Johnson back in 1868, and then a hundred years go by, Richard Nixon, Bill Clinton, now Donald Trump. But I'm so interested in that, that empty century with, and and I, I, I'm old enough to have been around for, for Nixon's turn. And at the time, it seemed almost as though this tool that was being used had this, like it had been pulled out of the back of an attic with dust covering it, sort of like, like a, some sort of old weapon, like a battle axe or a saber, that, the, that it was problematically obsolete is almost how it felt. And now we're, you know, uh, th these 50 years later, it's been invoked seriously three times. But what, what was that that long gap about? How was impeachment perceived? Yeah, we've actually got two long gaps there. One uh, from the time it's written into the Constitution uh, till Andrew Johnson, about 80 years, and then a second one of, a, of another century. Uh, and, and now we've done it um, three times within the lives of some of the people in this room. Uh, um, it is, at both of those occasions, with Johnson and again with Nixon, treated as, as something of a, a constitutional oddity. Uh, although we are impeaching federal judges periodically in, in the interim, and that is the same mechanism, the same provision of the Constitution. So it's not as if uh, this goes wholly unused. Uh, both times, uh, with, with Nixon and with Johnson, what you're seeing is uh, a turn toward the Constitution to resolve a set of questions that, that are very difficult to, to adjudicate in any other way. Uh, the Constitution lays out impeachment as, as a particular process. Uh, the founders are probably, well, we know they're thinking about a, a, a fellow named Warren Hastings, who doesn't come up very often now, uh, but he was the British official in charge of India. Uh, he faced, if you think it's bad now, his impeachment ran for something like seven years. Uh, so this news cycle could get a lot worse. Uh, um, and, and they're thinking about impeachment as a mechanism for holding the person they've placed in charge of the republic in, in a really remarkably powerful position. The president has powers that the King of England hasn't exercised at that point in a century. And they're nervous about this. They're creating this incredibly powerful chief executive. And they want to be sure that if that official abuses his or her power in office, if that official uh, is subverting the system itself, there needs to be a corrective. And they talk about where that corrective should be. Should it be vested in the Supreme Court? Should it be uh, just the election that comes every four years? And what they conclude is, you want to put that power in the hands of the people's elected representatives. You want to split it as a safeguard so that the House of Representatives investigates and, and essentially indicts. That's what impeachment is. It's, it's functionally similar to an indictment. And then the Senate tries the case uh, with the Chief Justice of the United States presiding over that trial. And so they come up with this mechanism, uh, but it is a little bit set off to the side with, with a you know, break glass in case of emergency uh, instruction written on it. Uh, and for Unfortunately, we haven't had that many constitutional emergencies that have justified breaking the glass. Uh, but we shouldn't regard it as, and I think this is really key, the founders didn't regard it as a failure of the system. They didn't regard it as a calamity in its own right. Uh, instead, they regarded it as a necessary corrective. If you want to keep the system functioning properly, and, and Franklin says this, you, you don't want a, a tyrant to, to require assassination. You, you don't want to give people no recourse uh, for correcting something other than violence, revolution, and they're thinking about revolution, right? Um, you want to have a mechanism built into the system itself with safeguards and procedures and rules so that you have a rule-bound process for adjudicating a fundamental dispute uh, about whether or not the president is properly exercising his power. That's what impeachment is. And Susan, do, is there, has there been clarity on the rules? Because it seems that every time an impeachment process has gone to this extent of fullness, that part of the conversation is, well, what do we mean by a high crime and a misdemeanor. What, what, the part of the conversation begins not what did the person do wrong, that becomes part of it, but part of it is, well, what do we mean by 
uh, the, the sort of act or, or behavior that justifies using this tool. Yeah, so this is sort of a, that's something that comes up every single time, whether or not there needs to be essentially an indictable crime in order to, to have impeachment, to, to sort of qualify as that high crime and misdemeanor. Um, I think as a legal matter, uh, that's probably not correct. Um, so the scholar Charles Black once said, um, if the president were to decide to move to Saudi Arabia because he wanted to have multiple spouses and he was going to conduct the office by a correspondence course, or sort of by, by correspondence, um, the so long as his passport was in order, he wouldn't be committing a crime. That said, we can all understand that that would be such a breach of sort of his obligations to discharge his, his duty, to take care that the laws be faithfully executed, that would be impeachable. Now, the fundamental reality, of course, is that it's up to the House of Representatives to determine what is an impeachable offense, mm -hmm. what qualifies as a high crime and misdemeanor. And so it's, it's a little bit of sort of overlapping Venn diagrams. We understand that there is some criminal conduct that actually doesn't necessarily rise to the level of impeachment. Um, so pre-presidential criminal acts is something that sort of is a little bit of an, in a murky area. Is um, that off the table? Or do we? is it not even that clear cut? I, I don't think it's clear cut. I, I think that sort of falls into a gray area. That said, in the Clinton impeachment and, and uh, lack of conviction, the, the Congress essentially determined that sort of minor criminality related to, and I'm sort of using um, air quotes there, related to covering up personal indiscretions, that even, if, even among people who believed it was technically criminal, that wasn't impeachable. Um, and so, you know, we, we have sort of these, uh, these overlapping circles of, of what's going to fall into something that, that really is a sufficiently grave offense, an offense against the office. And I don't think it necessarily rests on this narrow question of sort of, it can, some, can somebody be indicted or not? That said, if you don't actually have criminal conduct, it, it's going to be hard for, for Congress to make the case to the public about what exactly is wrong and, and what exactly is the breach at issue. And it's clear that it, it it cannot be about a particular policy. For example, if somebody is upset that the administration is separating families at the border and sees that as a terrible thing, that's not grounds for impeachment. Or, or is it? Could it be? So as a technical matter, impeachable, impeachable grounds or whatever the House of Representatives decides are impeachable grounds. That said, I think whenever you look at sort of the history, uh, you know, of how the impeachment clauses uh, were, were decided and how they've been used over time, impeachment is not supposed to be a remedy for sort of policy differences, right? So there's a reason we aren't seeing the House of Representatives or many people in the House of Representatives talking about family separations as being sort of grounds for impeachment. Lots of people feel very, very strongly about that on moral grounds. That said, that falls in the category of essentially policy disagreements. And so impeachment is supposed to be this extraordinary remedy that is, you know, is to be used when the president has sort of committed a crime against the Constitution, not just done something that, that you don't like as sort of a, a policy or, or legislative matter. What do you think is, is the public's most common misconception about impeachment? I don't know, and I, I guess we should sort of look at, at the polling on it. I, I think sort of the, the most common mis misperception is that um, the history of impeachment is everybody agrees on it, right? The impeachable offense comes out and, and it's clear cut and there's, it's really, really obvious. And so, so somehow um, Congress is breaking the rules, right? Or, or trying to, to apply this remedy to, to something that it's not supposed to be used for. Or there are procedural rules that the president is necessarily entitled to. Mm -hmm. you know, that's just not the case that you know, we ask our members of Congress, just like we ask the president, to swear this oath of office. And, and this decision about what is impeachment how to go about discharging this function, it, it really it returns to sort of the, the members of Congress's, uh, you know, discharging that oath, and, and, and it evolves quite a bit over time. And, and Yoni, know, there's just also the issue, I think, that uh, many, many folks might just think the word impeach means remove from office, and that, that it's actually a two-step process, and that um, uh, th two presidents have been impeached so far, and we're not removed from office. So I think potentially there's that misconception as well. Yeah, I think people tend to think of impeachment as an outcome rather than a process. Uh, and, and we're moving toward the impeachment of a president in the House for the third time. Uh, the votes do appear to be there as of today. Um, and 
that does not mean, uh, as in the two previous instances where Congress has gone there, uh, that he will necessarily be removed after a trial in the Senate. I think that that also gets to the second part of this uh, in terms of public misperceptions. Many people think of this as essentially a criminal trial taking place in a different venue. Uh, and some of the president's defenders this time, as with uh, Clinton's defenders, as with Nixon's defenders, play up on that misperception. Uh, I saw uh, one senator who prides himself on his uh, fidelity to the Constitution citing the Sixth Amendment yesterday. Uh, um, and I, I guess that I see things like that and, and I hope that it's being done as an insincere partisan gambit because it would be kind of terrifying if you believed it. Um, but, but in fact, what we have in, in the Congress is a very different kind of process that's laid out. It's an inherently political process. And what it's trying to adjudicate, right, it's, it's not just high crimes and misdemeanors, it's treason, bribery or high crimes and misdemeanors. And as Charles Black and others point out, if you put those three terms together, what they share, what the first two share in common, and presumably the third based on the, the statutory history at the time uh, shares as well, these are breaches of fiduciary trust, right? The, in, in the case of treason and bribery and really high crimes and misdemeanors, you're talking about a president who is not serving the best interests of the United States, who has put some other set of interests ahead of the national interest. And typically, though not always, that is where charges of impeachment have come down, that in some way the president is betraying his responsibility to the public. Uh, sometimes that can be out of a policy fight. Sometimes it can be out of a criminal deed. Uh, but the question of gravity really attends to that last part. Is it a fundamental betrayal of public trust? Mohammed, thank you for your patience. I was, I was waiting for the perfect moment to bring you into the conversation, and here we here are. It is. Here it is. All right. uh, the great thing about your organization is that they've been collecting data for a long, long time. So you're here to help us bridge the conversation we've been having about the general principles in the past to the present moment. Talk to us about the, the, we were talking ahead of time. You, you can tell us where the nation was on Nixon's impeachment and compare that to the present day. Yeah, um, uh, well, if Justin um, can put up the slide uh, with the table on it, we could all look at that together. Um, what's interesting is that unlike the Clinton impeachment and the support for it in public opinion, um, when you look at uh, Nixon's impeachment, you did see 58% of Americans uh, right, as, right before he resigned say that in fact he should be uh, removed from office. What's interesting now, of course, we're at 51% with President Trump. Uh, we started sort of in the mid 40s during the Mueller era uh, or the Mueller report days. Um, it jumped up to 52%. Um, and then uh, now we're back at 51%. The interesting comparison, though, between Nixon and now um, is that in uh, this case of Nixon, there was about a 40-point difference along partisan lines on whether or not people felt Nixon should be impeached. So it was actually 31% of Republicans at the time supported uh, Nixon's removal from office. Today, that 40-point divide has grown to an 80-point partisan divide. Um, and only 7% of Republicans uh, today think that uh, President Trump, for example, should be removed from office. So the partisan divide has really um, played itself out in the impeachment question. Of course, we all know that we're living in a very uh, divided uh, political world in America in terms of partisanship. But it is interesting to see um, how much worse it's gotten um, when you look at that. Of course, the partisan divide is also apparent when you look at presidential approval um, and a lot of other metrics. But that's really the big difference, I think, between then and now is that extra partisan spin to it. The other thing is just the political environment, I think, is different. We were talking about this in the back as well. Um, a lot of the rules and uh, laws that we just heard these brilliant people discuss are really based on a premise of refrainment on the part of uh, people in public office. So the notion that um, a president would sort of openly commit treason or openly say, I don't care that, uh, you know, this is corrupt, wasn't expected. Um, I think we're entering a time now where we see that language kind of changing. I mean, when we see the chief of staff of the White House basically say, so what if there was a quid pro quo? Everybody in Washington is like that. It gets to the point where, you know, it supports some of the data that we have it shows where Americans do agree. So we're very divided when it comes to just about everything until you ask people about corruption in government. 78% of Americans today think corruption is widespread in government. Um, 
37% of Americans have confidence in the electoral process. In 2009, it was 59%. So not too long ago, a majority of Americans still had faith in the process. But what Americans, sadly, and uh, very interestingly in data, actually agree about are the ways in which the system is broken. Of course, the remedies um, are very different and proposed to be very different by, by the parties uh, in power or, or competing for power. But that notion that there is a, something very wrong with the system, um, that people are highly dissatisfied with the way things are going in the United States. The last time a majority of Americans were satisfied with the way things are going in the United States was 2005. So it's been quite a bipartisan story of frustration. You don't see the 70s and 80 percent these days and, until you ask those questions. And you were saying that the politicians who frustrate the public don't aren't just Republicans but Democrats as well. That the that the case of Hunter Biden exactly. is coming up as part of you know, that's one of the things you're saying your polling is showing people are actually upset about. Well, if you if you're one of those 78 percent of people, um, you know, is is it uh, really believable? I mean, uh, Gallup were a rare animal in this town. We are staunchly neutral and nonpartisan, and we want to remain that way, and we always will. Um, but thinking about it, kind of putting your partisan hat away, when you think about the fact that eight out of 10 Americans say corruption is widespread in government, um, is the vice president's son having a, a financial arrangement in an industry he has no expertise in with a country that plays a critical role in US foreign policy, something that most people would see as sort of kosher? Um, I would argue probably not. Um, and that's why it's not 41% of people that say it's widespread. It's 78% of people that I, say corruption. I'd like to be able to bring some of your questions into the conversation. So I want to remind you, if you send them in using the app, we'll, I'll, I'll try to bring them in at the end. Um, but I, I want to turn to Susan with the, the table set, as Mohammed just did, of this, this overwhelming cynicism about the federal government, about the process. I mean, the impeachment is operating at the federal level, and it would seem very, very easy for anyone to cast this procedure as essentially cynical in itself. And in fact, again, the record shows that the opposition party for most of the process leading up to an impeachment is in fact claiming that, that the process itself is illegitimate. Um, so g given what mom is just saying now about the, the public's loss of faith in uh, our leaders overall, what, what do the Democrats need to be careful about in presenting this case at all? So I think um, the, f the core question here is what should and shouldn't be included in articles of impeachment. And there's a risk of being over-inclusive and there's a risk of being under-inclusive. So if we go back to sort of, you know, what is a common misperception about impeachment? I think one of the misperceptions is that an impeachment without removal is a failed impeachment somehow. I don't think that's the right way to look at it. Impeachment is itself uh, an important constraint on the presidency. It is the House of Representatives saying, this is impeachable conduct, whether or not uh, the Senate actually decides to remove somebody from office. And so as the House sort of is making their choice right now about what articles of impeachment to include, the narrowest being sort of just this, you know, specific issue with Ukraine uh, holding up military aid, the most broad being kind of a spaghetti at the wall approach, throw absolutely everything at it, even things like those, you know, policy, de policy decisions. Even in the middle of that, there are really hard questions. So we, we're talking about sort of ethics and, and corruption in government. Should there be an article of impeachment on things like a violent violations of the emoluments clause? So we haven't seen prior presidents sort of refuse to di divest from their businesses. We haven't seen this kind of flagrant dare of saying, well, I'm gonna do whatever I can get away with that we're seeing in the current president. We're seeing that the judicial branches fundamentally sort of doesn't move at a quick enough pace to be responsive to that. And so that really does leave the responsibility uh, you know, in the hands of Congress. And so on one hand, it might be tempting for members to say, well, we're going down this road of impeachment. We need to constrain the office. We need a way to sort of uh, express this let's just put in an article of impeachment on a violations of the emoluments clause. The problem there is that you're, because Congress hasn't used other remedies, they haven't passed laws or, or held hearings or sort of done things to, to use their ordinary tools to constrain those types of abuses, it is going to end up being perceived as sort of impeachment as an end run around the inability to mount a legislative coalition. And that's why Congress is going to need to be really, really thoughtful. So, so you would not include, if, again, you're not advising 
advising anybody in this, but if you were th hypothetically advising the Democrats in this, you would suggest not including the emoluments clause? Yes, yeah, so I, I wouldn't include things like the emoluments clause. I would include an article on lying to the American public. That was an important part of the articles of impeachment for both Nixon and Clinton. It's become something that we kind of shrug about right now. You know, it's not a crime to lie to the press. We heard the president say that. It's not a crime to lie to the New York Times. That's right, but it is, it, it should be thought of as fundamentally unacceptable to lie to the American public. And when you lie to the press, that's what you're doing. You're lying to the American public. But how much lying, honestly, because every... <laughs> Which president hasn't lied to the American public? Where's the bright, bright line there? That's, that's true. And so, uh, you know, sort of uh, any kind of presidential lie, anything that might fall within sort of the, the uh, you know, area of political spin, obviously those aren't things we're talking about. But whenever we're talking about sort of core, uh, you know, presidential conduct and, and the kinds of things that the president has lied about in this instance, it, it then becomes, you know, I, I think more difficult, uh, you know, to, to turn a blind eye to that stuff because anything that isn't included here, it's essentially being ratified as not rising to the level of impeachment. And I think we have to think about the ramifications for the office in the long term. I just wanted to add, this is such a good point about the New York Times or, or any press. Um, again, a comparison to Nixon to now, we're at a low point in people's trust in the honesty and, uh, you know, just straightforwardness of news. So media organizations in this country are actually facing a co confidence crisis. 40% uh, of Americans now say that the news that they receive is sort of honest and fair and unbiased, et cetera. Um, during the time of Nixon, it was like much closer to 70s, high 70%. So even that notion of like, who are the American people and who's lying to whom, you see how these perceptions can really change the public conversation at least um, around whether something like that is impeachable. Is it from the perspective of the president's base, is the New York Times really the American people? Um, and, is, and are they lying to the American people? Th these questions were not as, I think, um, uh, aggressively debated in the era of Nixon. There was kind of an understanding that the press was the press and their job is to report um, and hold leaders accountable. And I think, you know, we've come to an era now, particularly in news, political news content, um, where it's just a very different world and it creates openings to undermine what is a very legitimate legal point that you make, which is you are misleading the public that you were elected to. You know, I want to go back to the question about, about the process appearing legitimate. Yeah. Ha has its legitimacy always been attacked uh, as the process is unfolding? And is that an issue that we need to be concerned about? Always and invariably, and yes, we should be concerned. So it's, it's a recurrent problem. You know, I think that, that if you want a precedent for what we're seeing right now, the right place to look isn't Nixon, it's, it's Andrew Johnson, uh, the, the president who succeeds Lincoln in office. Um, you know, we're in a highly partisan time. They had just emerged from a civil war that had claimed three quarters of a million lives. Um, that, was, that was pretty polarized. Uh, and they had an avowedly partisan press, not just a, a press which some people thought suspiciously was part, but, but papers that were Democratic papers or Republican papers. That was how the press worked. Uh, um, and so you had a real information problem too. Uh, What's interesting is that Congress has gone here three times. Um, Johnson tries and, and fails to even secure the presidential nomination uh, after his uh, impeachment doesn't result in his removal in the Senate. Uh, Nixon resigns, gives way to Ford, who loses to Carter. Uh, Clinton uh, is term limited out and, and Gore runs after the largest economic expansion post-war uh, and, and gets beaten by George W. Bush. Uh, I, I think that although partisanship is, uh, is a dangerous force in our own time, and there's certainly the, the attacks on legitimacy of the process are, are worrying. Uh, impeachment can work in a variety of ways. It, it is Congress's way, the House's way, at least, of, of drawing a line and saying, if you cross this line in office, if you break these norms, here is our enforcement mechanism. We're going to drag you into a trial in front of the Senate. You're going to have to defend your own conduct. Uh, it will do lasting political damage to yourself, your legacy, your party. Don't do that. Uh, and, and that is a message which most presidents uh, have taken to heart. Uh, and so one reason why we have the 100 years after Johnson is Johnson tried to defy Congress. Johnson tried to direct reconstruction, uh, in his phrase, uh, to, to create a white man's government in a, in a white man's republic. And Congress told him to cut that out and amended the Constitution to cut it out and passed laws to cut it out. And Johnson repeatedly defied it. Uh, and, and Congress slapped him down. And after that, 
Uh, you go 100 years without another impeachment, in part because presidents got the message. Uh, if Congress is passing laws and asking you to faithfully execute them, you can't just blow off Congress. It will act. Uh, and so whether or not uh, an impeachment results in removal uh, is not always the most salient question. But what if you're a president who never flinches? Never. No matter what you're found doing or have been accused of. Never. You haven't blinked once. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Does, does impeachment act as that corrective on behavior, do you think? Well, I, you know, Johnson was that guy. He's out he was, there in no. the middle of impeachment threatening to lynch the leader of the opposition. Um, with, you know, at, at campaign rallies, which no sitting president has had before. He was a norm-shattering, uh, uh, uncouth outsider who, who said things that, that others simply had not said and, and persistently broke laws in the way that previous presidents had not broken them. Uh, and he did not flinch in the face of impeachment. Uh, he tried to fight it. He may have, in fact, bribed his way out of it. It's a little unclear. Uh, um, <laughs> but even so, it was a warning not just to him but to his successors. The Nixon Presidential Library is a wonderful series of oral histories. Uh, and they went and they interviewed lots of Republican members of, of the House, of the Senate, and, and said, what, what made you turn? What made you decide uh, not to support Nixon? And, and uh, the recurrent theme I find in those interviews is not that they suddenly decided that, that Richard Richard Nixon was a really bad guy who had to go. They thought forward. They, they imagined what would happen if they did not act. They imagined a Democratic president coming in and behaving precisely as Richard Nixon was then behaving. And, and that was what they couldn't countenance. Not Nixon's own behavior in, in pursuit of ends that they largely shared, but rather the behavior, the misbehavior of a president, uh, which if they left unchecked, would encourage his successors, who might not share their partisan views or policy views, to act in precisely the same way. And, and that, I think, to the extent that there is hope for anything to transcend partisanship at this moment, it would be craven partisan self-interest. It would be Republican members of the House and Senate looking at what President Trump is doing. Imagine President Warren doing exactly these things in furtherance of her own policy agenda and deciding that maybe this is a good place to draw the line. Sarah, we have a question from the audience. Do you think the polarization of our time is permanent? It's not an easy question, but what do you think? I don't know, right? This isn't sort sure. of polarization is not necessarily my field. I would say, though, this is a ca an area in which we really need Congress to act despite polarization, and we need them to ignore the polls a little bit here and decide, you know, this this really core question of how, what is, uh, you know, a, a faithful execution of the office of a, of a presidency. Is it okay for the president of the United States to pick up the phone and ask for an investigation of an American citizen in violation of that American? American citizens' constitutional rights, their rights to due process, right? The, the, these sort of, uh, you know, important, the very, very richly layered normative constraints we're seen in the, we've seen in the domestic context. Is it okay for a president to do an end run by essentially going to use a foreign law enforcement apparatus? Is it okay for the president of the United States to use congressionally appropriated aid to effectively extort a foreign leader into becoming an opposition researcher? Those are really, really important questions. And one thing we've seen over the history of the American presidency is this is not a static office. It's an office that, that changes a lot over time. It's an office of people testing the boundaries and either getting away with it or not getting away with it. And so once again, we are at this really, really critical moment moment where we have to ask ourselves not just, you know, what will Donald Trump's polling look like, you know, in November, but really what what is the purpose and nature of the American presidency and what happens if the, the ultimate decision here is, is to say we've seen this conduct, we've seen what the White House itself has acknowledged and admitted to, we've determined that, that that's ex essentially acceptable, you know, what will be the long-term consequences? Another question, what role does the press, uh, does the press play in impeachment? Um, have you given any thoughts to that? I actually wanted to answer that question on the floor. <laughs> since you said... So you know, do that. Uh, I think that um, I'm not so uh, pessimistic on that, and here's why. Um, America's pendulum swings pretty dramatically. Um, we went from George W. Bush to Barack Obama to Donald Trump. Um, I think what you saw happen in the last election in both the Republican and Democratic Party is a real crisis of what is this party 
who are on both sides? Who are we? Why is Bernie Sanders challenging the leader of our party? Why is a guy getting uh, attention for putting Lindsey Graham's phone number on the internet and calling everybody in his party stupid? Um, that's a really clear picture that those folks have realized people are kind of fed up with the partisanship. I think if you, we need to watch a couple more election cycles to really see whether or not this is kind of our new normal. So the impeachment story is definitely to be continued. And I want to thank all of you for coming here this morning. Thanks, everybody.